Global transportation and logistics company Aramex is a real Arab entrepreneurial success story. Founded in 1982 as a small Middle Eastern courier service, it rapidly expanded to compete with some of the big players in the industry and to become the first Arab company to list on the Nasdaq Stock Exchange. Co-founder Fadi Khantour stepped down from his position as CEO last year to take on a more strategic role as Vice Chairman. He's here today to speak with us about the secret to the company's success and its direction in the future. Fadi, welcome to INSEAD Knowledge. You've been described as a man who embraces risk and is not afraid to fail. How important has this fearlessness been to Aramex's success? Uh, I, don't know if, yeah, I don't know if anyone is not afraid to fail, really, so it's not uh, a fair description totally. Um, I'm not afraid to try. Uh, and it's in the trying uh, that uh, you get failure eventually. But uh, there is that balance between actually being confident enough to say, uh, I'm, if I fall, uh, if I fail, I will try again and actually make it. it. It's very essential that you don't fear failure, but you have to have fear. From very early on, Aramex formed alliances with major players in the industry. How important is it for any company to form these strategic partnerships? Yes, if you don't have much resources and today's entrepreneurs will always scramble for resources, go for strategic partnerships and, and uh, you will, uh, you will uh, share knowledge, you will share technology, you will share clients, you will share experiences. Uh, it got us to where we are today because we understood from the early days that we will be able to go global only when we partner with others that are like us. As a Middle Eastern startup, what challenges did Aramex face? Oh, plenty. Every challenge that you can imagine in life. And imagine that, that this is a business in, in back in 1982 when there was very little capital and very little, uh, the laws were not conducive to actually uh, allow us to expand into every city and every country in the region. So the, the access to capital was a problem, opening up the markets, uh, getting licenses from uh, postal authorities because postal authorities thought the courier companies were their own competitors. So we had to get specific licenses from the postal, uh, from government to allow us to operate in that space. Uh, recruiting people was a big issue because as a startup, uh, people would question your survival. Uh, so they would not come for work for you. They want to go and work for big brands. And being a people company, that was a big struggle. You know, we were like begging people. So you eventually get middle range people or you get mostly what we did in Aramex is we started recruiting uh, purposefully uh, young uh, highly educated uh, people uh, that uh, from universities and train them in-house uh, to build the company with us so that's why you have a fantastic management team that's been with Aramex 20 25 years today they all had their first job in Aramex and never left. Innovation is a real catchword at the moment. How important has it been to Aramex's success and should companies today be, be investing more in this area? I have a saying that says, you know, you, you copy paste and then you innovate. Uh, Aramex in its origins was copying what others were doing, uh, what our competitors were doing. There was nothing different that we did. We did it only a little bit with less cost for the client because that's the only way we could compete when you don't have a powerful brand. So I'd knock on your door and tell you I am just like DHL, but I'm 10% less expensive. But then that doesn't last long because competing on price is, is, uh, doesn't work because eventually your competitor will actually be able to match your price and then you're in a war that nobody wins and the smaller guy will actually exit. So we eventually had to innovate. We had to create new uh, products. Uh, we started doing air freight. We started doing sea freight. We started doing trucking. We started doing third party logistics. We started, we are the biggest operator in domestic intra-city and intra-country deliveries. Uh, we became the largest e-commerce operator today delivering for e-commerce and enablers in, in the Arab world. We created products that brought in e-commerce and enabled people to shop in the West and ship their packages back through our shop and ship product, which is uh, the biggest growing product in Aramex today. So yes, you copy. It's okay to copy. There's nothing wrong with copying your competitors. But then if you don't innovate, you won't survive. So yes, we, we did. We have tens of small products today that are a product of our experience with our clients. And innovation 
is a combination of two things. One, understanding what you do and your capabilities and seeing what you can do more with them and different with them. And it's also listening to the client and their requirements. Not necessarily direct requirements from you, but you hear their problems. And then you come back and look at your infrastructure and say, what can I do with this infrastructure that we've built that I can get the client to benefit from? And then all sorts of products will pop up because of that. Even products that we couldn't have imagined. Aramex was the, the first Arab-based company to be listed on the NASDAQ Stock Exchange in 1997. In 2002, it was bought back into private ownership and then three years later listed on the D Dubai financial market. Were these strategic moves or was it just responses to the environment at the time? A combination of both. So more strategic really. Uh, we were public on NASDAQ for five years. We did well. Uh, we wouldn't be here today and we wouldn't be the company that we are today if we had not gone public on, on, on the NASDAQ stock exchange. But we were a small company micro cap if you want, listed on a massive exchange in a region that was not very uh, looked at positively around the world. So every, uh, every single skirmish that happens somewhere, every uh, little bomb that pops up here and there, they would think we, our business is going to get affected. So our stock was stagnant. There was very little liquidity on it. We didn't, uh, we didn't get the value that we were looking for. And uh, we thought coming back to a, a market that is in the region where our brand is strong, uh, it's recognized, uh, a, a, a relatively medium-sized company in a, in a, in a medium-sized exchange, we're bigger, uh, much more attractive. But originally we went public on NASDAQ because we weren't able to attract capital from the Arab markets. We, we tried to do a private placement, by the way. I mean, it's a case of, of, of success because of a failure. So we failed at raising money in the Arab world because we were a non-asset based company and the Arab investors were not sure whether they wanted to invest in non-assets, uh, how to value non-assets. They wanted to see that we owned buildings and land and warehouses, but we didn't own anything. We only owned the client experience. So there was an aversion to it. Mm -hmm. These were the old days when there was no private equity funds. So we said, if the Arab world doesn't want to invest in us, we're going to go west. And know what, you know, the Arab uh, investors, actually, when we decided to go on NASDAQ, the biggest investors that came to invest in us were, com were coming from the region because they suddenly saw, ah, OK, if NASDAQ accepts these guys, they must be legitimate. And when you are on a public exchange as NASDAQ, as respectable as NASDAQ, you are going to get uh, re recognition and, and acceptance and respect. Banks would look at us differently. Clients would look at us differently. Strategic partners would look at, at us differently. Uh, clients would be much more, uh, you know, they would think we're global uh, because we're listed on NASDAQ. They wouldn't, so a lot of people didn't even know we were a company from here. Ironically, the, the last few years has been some of Aramex's most successful. At a, at a time when most companies are battling the economic downturn, you've been able to actually expand and open new businesses. What's your secret here? The reason why is because we're a non-asset based business. And that has paid off massively for us. What do I mean by non-asset based? It means we, we don't believe that we need to own the asset to actually manage it. So we don't own aircrafts. We uh, lease our offices. We uh, build warehouses. Some of them we own. Some of them we don't. The idea is that we can use our capital best to develop our people, because we are in a people industry, to develop our technology and to make sure our network operates properly. When the financial crisis happened, we didn't have assets to worry about uh, that burdened us. We didn't, we didn't have debt because when you don't have high debt, uh, your also maneuverability and agility is much higher than others. So when everybody was, was suffering in, at the time uh, of the financial crisis, we were a company that actually took advantage of that, which means airlines came to us begging for business because there was not much flying. So I was, I, it was a buyer's market. And then being a non-asset based company means I don't have to fly a half full aircraft, fly a half full uh, aircraft. I will fill the half for other people and I will pay on, on a flexible basis rather than have it carry the burden on a daily basis that I have to fill that aircraft. So, uh, so we thrived, yes. If, if you look at our numbers in 2009, you will find that our revenue dropped by about 10%, but our net income was up by 25%. Just because we had no debt and we were not burdened 
by the assets that we had. And the costs went down, you know, everything went down at that time. And at the same time, we accumulated cash. And we had a very healthy balance sheet. Uh, and 2010, we decided to be much more aggressive in acquisitions. And we felt that uh, becoming the emerging markets logistics company was our strategy for the future, uh, focusing on markets like, uh, that are like the Middle East, Southeast Asia, if you want, South Asia, and specifically Africa. So we went out on an acquisition uh, uh, strategy. We bought a company in South Africa. We bought a couple of companies in East uh, Africa. We bought a company in, uh, we, uh, we bought our partner in Bangladesh, in Malaysia. We set up a big hub in Singapore. So when, when everybody, when, when, look, the best time to invest is when the market is slow and nobody is, is, is running to, to actually do things. So when the market is slow, rents are lower, everything that you do uh, are, are at a different cost. So we took advantage of that because we had a lot of cash. So we were lucky in a, in a, in a sense. Aramex now has 12,000 people in 150 locations around the world and heads the Global Distribution Alliance. What now for the company? The, the strategy of the organization has been to be the emerging markets logistics company, and that will continue, continue to build our uh, Africa network, uh, uh, building the trade routes from China, Southeast Asia, South Asia, Middle East, and Africa. These are very interesting trade routes. Uh, competition in these spaces are still a little behind, so it's a niche that we are focusing on. Africa specifically is a fantastic opportunity. The Arab world continues to do well, even though in turmoil, the Arab economies, if you look at them, have grown about 4% last year. So uh, more to do in, in the areas we're in and uh, uh, focusing more on emerging markets and being the company in emerging markets. What opportunities are coming out of Africa at the moment and what challenges do you see there? We, we bet on Africa two years ago, and today, if you open any magazine, you will see it, any business magazine, they will talk about African opportunities. It's opening up, uh, markets are opening up, it, free trade agreements are happening, they trade with each other, talent is available, uh, foreign investment is coming in, uh, transparency is happening, governance attracting uh, foreign lo foreign investment laws that are attractive for people like us it's it's exciting times the challenges there is the infrastructure massive massive infrastructure is lacking uh, that's because for of years and years of neglect uh, but that's changing also uh, another challenge is also open borders for trade uh, even though they are doing something uh, here and there in certain countries, but it's always not enough. Uh, some political uh, instability is also a challenge, but you know what? Uh, for us, risk is, is, is relative. We, we live in a region that has always been politically risky, so when we go to a country that has political risk, we say it looks like home. <laughs> Party, thanks for being with us on NCAD Knowledge. Thank you. Thank you very much.